Testing. Okay. Good evening. My name is Sonali Carrizales, and I am a senior communications major here at the University of Tennessee at Martin. Tonight, I have the pleasure of introducing our speaker, Mr. Bobby Gonzalez. Bobby Gonzalez is an indigenous Latino lecturer, storyteller, and poet. He is the author of several books, including Taino Zen and The Last Puerto Rican Indian, a collection of days of poetry. Bobby has presented at Carnegie Hall, the National Museum of the American Indian, the Detroit Institute of Arts, and many other museums and colleges. He organizes and emcees the annual Bronx Native American Festival. Bobby was selected as a 2018-2019 New York City Indian of the Year. Bobby Gonzalez seeks to empower his audiences by encouraging them to embrace their heritage and use this knowledge to create a, dana a dynamic future. As an individual proud of his Native American, Latino, African, and European ancestry, Bobby is a messenger of hope, pride, and love of diversity. Ladies and gentlemen, let's give a warm Skyhawk welcome to Mr. Bobby Gonzalez. Thank you. I'm used to getting used to speaking with our mask on. Good evening. I hope you can understand me with my unusual accent. I'm from the Bronx, okay? And whenever I visit the South, I make a a very strong effort to speak slowly so you understand me. Before I begin, wherever I travel throughout the country, when I give a presentation, I always start it off by a land acknowledgement. I acknowledge the original people that lived on the land where I speak. So, of course, this evening I will acknowledge the Cherokee. Uh, the original inhabitants of Tennessee. And as you might know, they had to shed a tear and were forced to relocate to Oklahoma, and many of them had to walk through Tennessee. Imagine walking all the way to Oklahoma from here in the middle of winter. So I wish to acknowledge them. And I want to thank Mr. Anthony Stewart and the Student All Life and Multicultural Affairs Office for making it possible for me to be here. So what's the topic? Why Latinos are not Spanish, the cultural diversity of Hispanics. I recently was on a television show in New York City being interviewed for Hispanic Heritage Month. And the gentleman interviewing me wanted to get at my good side right away. He says, Mr. Gonzalez, I love Spanish food. And I roll my eyes. I love it when they say, I love Spanish food. I love Spanish music. Some of my best friends are Spanish. Well, actually, we're much more complicated than that. Uh, we're indigenous. We're African. Many of us are, have European heritage, and some of us have Asian Jewish ancestry. And it's all good. So where do I begin? She is a perfect example. Her name is Karen Olivo. She's an actress, a singer, a dancer, award-winning. She's been on Broadway in the productions of In the Heights and West Side Story. Her mother is Dominican and Chinese. Her father is Puerto Rican and Cherokee. A perfect example of that mosaic that I was speaking of. By the way, are there any Latinos here? Ah, are you all from Mexico? What country? Venezuela. Venezuela? That's it? Mexico, Venezuela, I'm from Puerto Rico. So if we had a conversation in Spanish, we might understand each other. So you know about that. Okay. I've been asked, Bobby, there are no black people in Mexico, right? I say, yes, there are. Maybe at least a million. And then it now only begins to be recognized and acknowledged. In fact, some people believe that Africans arrived here in the Americas before Columbus. But 
as yet they have found no solid evidence. And that's a tragedy that Spaniards conducted a, a massive book burning of the Aztec books in uh, the late 1500s because the information might have been contained right there in those books. Being a black chicken means that you can be affected by the senseless killings of black men on the street and also have relatives on the verge of being deported. Walter Thompson Hernandez. That's a relatively new term, black chicken, especially out in the West Coast. Some people are now embracing their African heritage, uh, even though they're Latino. Now, this is an interesting group, the Garifuna, or Garifuna. They originated in the Lesser Antilles Islands, islands known as Dominica, St. Vincent, and several others. And the original inhabitants of those islands were Caribs. By the way, the Caribs were not cannibals. That's some misinformation. So you had Caribs. The Spaniards came, occupied the islands, and brought in African slaves. The Africans mixed with the Caribs and formed a whole new group, Garifuna, sometimes known as Black Caribs. Now, when the English took over these islands, they found these Garifunas to be especially rebellious so they forcibly relocated them to Central America. Many eventually settled in Honduras, Nicaragua, and then they spread all over. There are now 150,000 Garifunas living in the Bronx. And they've maintained their language, their culture, the music and dance, which is a blend of African and indigenous. Now this is a photograph of a beauty pageant in Cuba. And in Cuba, all these young ladies are Afro-Cubans and they had their natural hairstyles. And that is very important. Uh, if you ever visit the Bronx, you'll be stunned to see that in a, a Latino neighborhood, there may be two or three beauty parlors on every block. And the primary jobs done in those beauty parlors are relaxing or straightening hair. Good hair, bad hair. Pelo bueno, pelo malo. And among Latin Americans still today, if you have your hair in a natural afro, it's considered bad hair. It's a negative connotation of being black. Uh, and some people refuse to accept their African heritage. Now, this is a family from Colombia. And they remind me of my family. You have everything here. Indigenous, European, African, very fair skin, light skin. I have cousins who with red hair and freckles. I have cousins who are very dark skinned and have afros. And we're all one family. But this is another family from Colombia. And they are from the people called the Koji. That is spelled K-O-G-I. And they live mostly in the mountains. They're close to a million Koji people and other native people in Colombia. If you ever visit Latin America, be very careful. Many people will be offended if you address them by the word Indio. Because for some people, Indio is uh, analogous to um, the N-word up here for African Americans. You're better off addressing them as indígena, indigenous, or the name of their people. Guatemala. Her name is Rigoberta Menchu. She is a Mayan woman, and she won the Nobel Peace Prize in 1992. You might want to read her book, I, Rigoberta, which is available in English or in Spanish. And in it, she discusses the genocidal war against her people in the 1980s in 
Guatemala, over 400 Mayan villages were burned down. 200,000 Mayan people were killed. Sometimes I ask, Bobby, your name is Gonzalez. How could you say you're Native American? And I answer back, well, where do most natives live? And they tell me, oh, the plains. Maybe the Midwest. Southwest? I said, no. Almost all natives live in Latin America. Maybe 40 to 50 million indigenous people in Central and South America and the Caribbean. And they speak hundreds of different languages. Diversity in religion. These young ladies are all Puerto Rican. And they live in Chicago. And they either convert to Islam or a rage of Islam. Uh, in my neighborhood, maybe half the people are not Christian. They're Hindu, Buddhist, Muslim, and a few atheists thrown in. Great diversity. And every year, until the pandemic, there was a big Puerto Rican parade in New York City. And these young ladies are expressing pride in being Puerto Rican and being Muslim. But why would Latinos convert to Islam? There are historical reasons. For almost 800 years, Muslims occupied Iberia, Spain, and Portugal. And for those nearly 800 years, Muslims, Christians, and Jews lived in relative peace. And Iberia was a center of learning for that part of the world. People used to come from Northern Africa, the Middle East, Western Europe, to come to Iberia and study the sciences, mathematics, learn how to play chess. But that all changed when Queen Isabella and King Ferdinand took over in 1492 and three, and they told the Jews and the Muslims, if you want to stay here, you have to convert. And many of them left. And Spain went into a decline after that. Realidades, realities. Some of you are studying to get into journalism. OK? Well, this is my friend, Humberto Pancho Cintron. He's half Chinese, half Puerto Rican. And he was the producer of the first Latino progr uh, program on NET, National Educational Television, which is now PBS. They changed the name from NET because people got turned off by the word educational. And to give you an idea of the challenges he faced and the crude technology of those days, he said, we would shoot a show, film it, and then the next show will be filmed using the same tape. So all those shows, many of them were lost forever. All right, Schomburg, the greatest, the largest center for African-American studies in New York City is in the Arturo Schomburg Center in Manhattan. But who was Arturo Schomburg? Arturo Schomburg was an Afro-Puerto Rican. And he, when he was a little boy in the 1880s, he raised his hand in class and asked the teacher, what about African history? And his teacher told him, Africans have no history. It was the 1880s, so he knew best and he kept quiet. But he embarked on a lifetime of research and accumulated a, a library of thousands of books on African and African-American literature and history. And most of those books are now in New York City at the Schomburg Center. And if you want to access those books, you can go online. Lucky you. We didn't have Google when I was in college. All right, some of you may know. Do, do any of you recognize this person from TV? OK. He was the host of the show. His name is Don Francisco. And he was the host of a TV show 
the most watched TV show in television history. And we've gone for about, I think, 40 or 50 years. He's still alive. And it was called Sábado Gigante, Giant Saturday. It was really ridiculous, three hours of audience participation and games and tricks, and, and there were great prizes. And people around the whole world would watch the show even though they did not speak Spanish. Now, Don Francisco, another example of diversity. He was born and raised in Chile. However, his parents were German Jews who in, 19, uh, in the 1930s fled from their country and settled down in Chile. By the way, there are many people in Central America who are not who don't consider themselves to be people of color. They consider themselves to be white, and they are white. Mongo Santa Maria. Some of you like salsa music, and the foundation of salsa is Afro-Cuban rhythms. And Mongo Santa Maria was a master percussionist, composer, arranger, but he had an advantage over many Latinos. Many of us who have African ancestors don't know exactly where we came from. Well, he says that when he was a little boy and he would misbehave, his grandmother would chase him with a stick and threaten to have him sent back to Guinea, to the country of Guinea. So he knew what country his family came from. Now, the most popular sport in the world is not football. Oh, it is football. It's called football. It's soccer. And arguably the greatest soccer player of all time was Pele, an Afro-Brazilian. Now, for centuries, Africans have been on the, at the bottom of the totem pole in Brazil in education and employment. And he was uh, a role model for them. Okay, now for the Mexicans in the house. This is Tenochtitlan, what's today called Mexico City. There is a stereotype that before Columbus came, the native people lived in the jungle and small villages, but they, got, they had great urban centers like Tenochtitlan with between two and 300,000 people. And they constructed courts of law, temples, they had schools of higher learning like the University of Tennessee Martin. They had libraries, they had zoos, they even had a department of sanitation. So every morning, over a thousand men would go out and clean the streets. And it was a very pristine city now, in those days, if you went to the streets of London or Paris, you'd have to watch your step. But you see all these beautiful buildings? This is an artist's rendition. Almost all these buildings were torn down by Cortez and the Spanish conquerors. This is in Chichen Itza, in the Yucatan Peninsula. The Mayans and the Aztecs built these magnificent pyramid temples and this one is very unique. If you count the steps, there are 365 steps, one for every day of the year. And if you're on top of those stairway and you speak to someone on ground level, every word you say will be heard clearly without the use of a microphone. And keep in mind they, were with, they had no beast of burden. All this was built with human labor. And on the other side is a carving of a, a large serpent. And if you go down there during the autumnal equinox, when the sun rises, the serpent seems to move. Now you see people walking up and down the steps. This is, this is an old photograph. People are not allowed to walk up and down the steps anymore. You can guess why. Someone started to come back down and fell all the way down and suffered a, a fatality. So no people allowed there. The Mayans and the Aztecs 
Well, they were great scientists, mathematicians. They found the movements of the stars and the planets and could predict eclipses. Very, very advanced people. They uh, developed a, um, the concept of zero before they did in, in Europe. Then came the Spaniards. And this image here is from the, the final attack in 1521. There were maybe 200 Spaniards that conducted the siege, but they had over 200,000 native allies who had been uh, under the, the spell of the Aztecs and Mexica. They were held almost in slavery, so they thought if they helped the Spaniards, they would get a better deal, but they didn't. Now, actually, we'll kill most of the Aztecs inside Tenochtitlan during the siege was disease. Now, we're all going through a pandemic now, but Native peoples are very accustomed to pandemics. Some historians estimate that within 200 years of the arrival of Columbus, more than 90% of the Native peoples of the Western Hemisphere died, mostly from disease. Imagine that. 90% or more, smallpox, yellow fever, et cetera. This is a very controversial, interesting uh, image. This is a so-called Olmec statue from Veracruz, Mexico. And some people point to this as evidence of an African presence here. You can never know. They destroyed all the books. I mean, they had libraries here with many, many books, and they had a massive book burn because they said, the priest said, these are works of the devil. And all that knowledge was lost forever. Now we move up. This is Benito Juarez, the first indigenous president of Mexico. When he was a little boy, he spoke on the Zapotec. He went to a Jesuit school Learn how to speak and read and write Spanish, and became an attorney, and five times was elected president of Mexico. By the way, he spoke Zapotec when he was a little boy. Many Mexicans who migrate to the Bronx can't speak Spanish. They speak a native tongue. They might speak Zapotec, Mixtec, Nahuatl, and they come here to learn Spanish. This is, um, this is changed. This, uh, this was from the census of 2000. Mexicans are the fourth largest tribe. How was that? Well, when you fill out the census, if you haven't yet, uh, let's, you, you write down, I am Latino. Then you're asked, well, what kind of indigenous, Afro, and so many Mexicans checked the indigenous uh, box that after the Navajo, the Ojibwe, and the Cherokee, they were the fourth largest tribe in the United States. That's changed since then. Now we're going on to South America. The Inca Empire, almost as long as the Roman Empire. Ecuador, Peru, parts of uh, Bolivia, going into the Amazonian jungle. Again, a very advanced civilization. They built the largest highway system in the world at that time. And some of it is so used today. And they didn't just walk up and down this highway. They would send messengers. Of course, they didn't have telephones, so they would send messages uh, via runners. And every so number of miles, there'll be a station where they will pass messages on to someone else, and they will continue the marathon run. All right, what are they doing here? These are Inca medical people. They're conducting surgery, and they're removing a brain tumor. And they were, again, advancing surgery. But what did they use as a 
anesthesia. As an anesthetic, they use coca leaves that they use today to make cocaine. And the survival rate was something like 30, 35%, but that's better than zero. Now, some of you are, are big fans of hip hop rap music. Now, this is a group from Ecuador called Los Ning, L-O-S-N-I-N. You can find them on YouTube. And they, they rap, but they rap in Quechua, the indigenous language of Ecuador. And this is a phenomenon all over the world. Young people are preserving their language and their history in hip hop music. And myself, I'm, I'm not a big fan of hip hop, but whatever it takes to preserve a language and a history, I'm all for it. Now my people from the Caribbean are the Taino. We were the ones who discovered Columbus. Well, he has many names. Christopher Columbus in English, in Italian Cristobal Colón, in Spanish Cristobal Colombo. Native people have many names for Columbus, but I can't be up here all night. All right. The Taino come from Puerto Rico in the lower right, Dominican Republic, Haiti, Jamaica, Cuba, and the Bahamas. Is anyone here from any of those islands? Nope. All right. Puerto Rico we call Borinquen. Haiti is a Taino word. It means high rocky country. Jamaica is Jamaica, land of wood and water. Cuba is a Taino word, but what it means we don't know. That's been lost to time. And the Bahamas we call Lucayo, island people. So the Spaniards came and they enslaved us. A little known fact is the first slaves in the Americas were not African, they were Taino. And in fact, the Middle Passage, the transporting of people to be sold into slavery began here. 500 of my ancestors were put on a ship in 1495 to be sold into slavery in Spain. And of course, Many of us die from disease, overwork, abuse, malnutrition, and that's when they began to bring in Africans in the early 1500s. Now, when the Africans encountered the Maitaino ancestors, it was like a family reunion. We got along very well. We got along so well, they tried to keep us apart, but that didn't work. Now, at the beginning, they brought almost all African men. And some of them ran off and began maroon communities, especially in Jamaica. And of course, they had no African women, so they married indigenous Taino women. And today in a region in Jamaica called Blue Mountain, you see many people who look different from the other folks. They have reddish brown skin, straight hair, and high cheekbones. Okay, any business majors here? All right. This is the wealthiest man in Latin America. His name is Carlos Slim. And last I checked this morning, he's worth $78 billion. Not bad. Uh, he's from Mexico, but he wouldn't come to to be Latino or Latin American. His family originated in Lebanon. And he married a Lebanese woman and speaks the language. And there are many wealthy business people in Latin America who originate from the Middle East. In fact, in El Salvador, there's a very large group of of wealthy businessmen who come from Palestine. He is Mapuche from the country of Chile. 
Now, up here in the north, you had these great horse warriors. You had the Comanche, the Cheyenne, the Blackfeet, the Sioux. In South America, you had the Mapuche. And for 300 years, they resisted all outsiders, the Spaniards, uh, and then the Chilean soldiers and the government. But they were finally conquered and put on reservations. Yes, there are native reservations in South America. But they lost, lost most of their land during the dictatorship of General Pinochet in the 1970s. Now, she is from the people called the Kuna, K-U-N-A. And they live on islands off the coast of Panama. And you see the artworks she has there, those, those weavings are called Mola. Now, her people know that the clock is ticking because of global warming. Some people don't believe in global warming, but Native people like her know the waters are rising up rapidly. And they know in the next generation or two, the islands will disappear and they'll have to relocate to their mainland. And there, their children will grow up in a dominant culture and lose the language and the arts that she's making there. There's someone here from Venezuela. Okay. You know who this is, right? All right. Hugo Chavez, uh, the late Hugo Chavez, was the president of Venezuela. Very controversial individual. Some people love him, some people hate him. And there's something said on both sides. But one thing that has to be said, in the history of Latin America, he was the first elected leader to express pride in both his indigenous and African ancestry. Before him, you would avoid that. But he embraced it every day. Now, this is Rafael Trujillo. He was a dictator of the Dominican Republic for 30 years. And he was a mulatto. He, was, he had African and European heritage. And he wanted to whiten the country. But he had brown skin. So every morning, he made it a habit of going to the bathroom and putting powder on his face to make himself look white. Now, I read this story, but I wanted to confirm it. So uh, on one of my journeys, I encountered Julia Alvarez, uh, who's a very prominent Dominican writer. She says, yes, that's a true story. He used to powder his face every day. His name is Evo Morales, and he was president of Bolivia, and he is an indigenous person, Otavalo, and he was deposed a few years ago. There is a movement afoot in Latin America, which is not new, in which very conservative uh, groups got together. Um, they unite with corporate interests, and they overthrow a legitimate government. And that's what happened to Evo Morales. Now, she is Aymara. She's Afro-Aymara. In her part of the, uh, where she lived in Bolivia, they brought an African men to work the silver mines. But the silver mines were on very high mountains. And the Africans didn't accustom themselves very well to the, the cold climate. So they were sent down land to work in sugar plantations. And there they encountered Aymara women. And now there are about 30,000 Afro Aymaras in the country of Bolivia. Her name is Belka, or was Belka Cáceres. Her people are called Lenca. That is spelled L-E-N-C-A. And they are one of the indigenous peoples of Honduras. And she was killed a few years ago. She was an environmental activist, a human rights activist. And environmental activists have a very short lifespan. 
in Latin America. Gold migrants used to come in, uh, loggers. People want to build uh, oil pipelines without any consideration for the land or for the people. And those who advocate for the people and for the land, unfortunately, get killed. I was discussing that earlier uh, about the pipelines that are being built in native country, both in South America and North America. And one negative aspect of uh, these pipelines is all these camps with all these, these workers, we call them men camps. And whenever they erect a men camp to help build uh, these oil pipelines, many women are raped and killed. Argentina. If I'm walking down the street of New York City and I hear someone speaking Spanish with an Italian accent, I say to myself, Argentina. Uh, not everyone comes from Spain. Many Argentinians are of Italian or French ancestry. In fact, when the Argentinian economy collapsed in the 1990s, many Argentinians fled to Italy because of the law in Italy saying if you have one Italian parent, you are automatically a citizen. So they said, okay, off we go. Now my history, eh? okay. My people came in the late 1940s from Puerto Rico. Puerto Ricans are not immigrants. Puerto Ricans are migrants. They're American citizens. In fact, Puerto Ricans have fought in every war on behalf of the United States, going back to the Revolutionary War. So they came here in the 1940s. My parents came here, didn't know a word of Spanish, no money in their pockets. Oh, they didn't know, they didn't know English, no money in their pockets. My mother had a sixth grade education. My father went to the second grade and put all three of us through college, the American dream. And then we lived in a housing project. I, I was telling someone earlier, Mr. Pruitt, he grew up in a town with 200 people. And he looked at me when I told him, well, I grew up in a city block where had 5,000 people in one city block in a housing project. And I loved it because we had a mixture. We had African-American, Latino, Native people, white Europeans, and we hung out together, played together, occasionally fought each other. We would visit each other's houses, eat each other's food, listen to each other's music, start dating each other, get married. I loved it, it was a great education. My family had a bodega. And I was telling someone earlier about how I overcame a stutter. And one way I overcame my stuttering was working in my family's bodega. Because once you step behind the counter, you're on stage with the, with the limelight on you. She grew up in the housing project. Sonia Sotomayor, who is now in the United States Supreme Court. Her mother is a doctor, still works in Syracuse, New York, and has practiced there. And like her, I have parents who instilled, instilled in me a pride in who I was and where we came from. And they also instilled in me a great respect of the dignity of the working people. And they taught me respect other people's beliefs and don't try to convert them to yours. So I'm very open, very tolerant. If you disagree with me, I won't get upset. I recently uh, spoke at the University of Mississippi. There was this young man there. He was a white Mississippian. And he had different perspectives than I did. I said, that's OK. You and I grew up in different worlds. We have different perspectives, different ways to look at the world. And that's OK, as long as we talk, dialogue, and listen to each other with respect. Now, I don't know if you know what a Native American powwow is. That's when Native people get together, put on their regalia, don't say, don't say costume, regalia, the Native clothing, and 
There's dancing and music and native food. Everyone has a good time. And every year in the Bronx, there are two Native American powwows. And I'm the one who organizes them and emcees them. Now, a couple years ago, there was a great event in my life. I went to a powwow in what's called Queens, New York. And they had an honoring dance for me. That's me in the middle with the blanket around me. They named me the New York City Indian of the Year. Here I am with the blanket. It's called a Pendleton blanket and the plaque. And this was significant because the Thunderbird dancers are all people from the north. They're Mohawk, Hopi, Navajo. And for the first time in 50 years, they named a person from Latin America as Indian of the Year. Oh, by the way, I'm Taino. When you read a, a book or listen to a professor saying, the Tainos were wiped out. I tell him, well, I met the Indian of the Year from New York City, and he was Taino. We're still here. Yalitza Aparicio. Another perfect example of an indigenous pride. I believe it was three years ago she was nominated for an Academy Award as Best Supporting Actress. Yalitza Aparicio. And she is a Mishtec woman from Mexico. And there was a great uproar in Mexico. People were saying, how could they nominate Una India, an Indian woman? They still have that problem, especially in Latin American media. If you watch any show on TV from Latin America, everyone is lily white. All right? Uh, and they've, they've been trying to make changes, but it's very hard. Uh, the racism is, is built into the system. But with help of people like you, that will change, right? Okay, that's the end of the slideshow portion. I just did 500 years and 50 minutes. So I told you I was very, very lucky. My mother and my father, every day would tell us stories about our grandparents, our great-grandparents, those who came from Spain, those who were indigenous to Yana, those who came from Africa. And it came out in their spiritual practices, practices as well. In the Caribbean and in Latin America, People practice a form of, you might call it religion, but spiritual practices, and they have ceremonies that combine elements of Christianity and African. Sometimes they call it santeria or espiritismos, spirituality. And they see no problem with that. They may go to church on Sunday, and on Saturday night, go out and meet at this old woman's house, who is also a curandera, a healer. So I've been talking a long, long time. At this point, I want to open the floor to the best part of the program, the Q&A. Who wants to be number one? Who wants to break the ice and ask a question? Ms. Journalist? You don't have a question? Not yet. Not yet? Now, you're from Latin America. Does it upset you when you watch TV? No. In Latin America on TV, they have what's called novelas. Soap operas, which are very, very popular. But you never see a woman of color. Oh, you see a woman of color. She might be la otra, the mistress. She might be a, a curandera, a so-called witch, but you will never see a, woman, a person of color as a love interest. And that's part of the built-in racism, which some people don't want to acknowledge. Who else here is from? You have Venezuela here, Mexico. What country? Venezuela. Venezuela. Nobody here? 
¿Cómo? Bolivia. Bolivia. You have quite a, a situation in Bolivia now. They default Evo Morales. It looks like they did it illegally. They had this very conservative right-wing group that was anti-indigenous. And then now they have, he's a white man, but he's very liberal. And because remember, when Evo Morales was there, he institutionalized bilingual education. So people could learn Spanish, but also learn their Aymara or other indigenous tongue. Anybody else from Latin America? The West Indies? Yes? Pomona? Pomona? Mexico? Mexico? What state? Canada. How many states are there in Mexico? You don't, you, you don't know? Okay, I won't tell you. We can Google that later. And it's, it's really ironic that there's such a, among some people, anti-Mexican sentiment in this country. And a big chunk of this country was one time Mexico. And the mythical homeland of the Aztecs was a land they called Aztlan. They say they came from up north. But how far north did they live? Well, I spoke at the University of Wyoming. And they told me in their Chicano studies program that Aztlan reached as far north as Wyoming. You had Cherokee people who live here in Tennessee. Woman man killer who, who passed away, wrote a book about her life and about the Cherokee people, and she said, according to oral traditions, Cherokees originated either in the island of South America or from Central America and came up here. So if you're Mexican, you might be related to the Cherokee. Hmm. As I travel, I dig up all these stories. But among Native people, there is a tradition. When someone tells you a story, you have to ask permission to pass it on. And if they say yes, then you go with it. But if they say no, you have to keep it to yourself. And one reason is, very often they'll tell their story to someone, they'll put it in print, and then they distort the words, they distort, uh, distort the message. So in order to keep the, the history intact, they stick to oral traditions. And I mentioned about the massive book burners in Mexico. There are still a few books out there that the indigenous people will not let go. Because they say, we don't have them last time. We're holding on to these. Any other questions? Yeah. Excuse me? Uh, do you recommend like any literature or articles or uh, any book about the Mexican? Okay, the best book about the indigenous people of Latin America is called The Open Veins of Latin America. And the author was, uh, yes, Eduardo Galeano. And that's a great book. And it was actually written back in the late 50s, early 60s. But in some ways, nothing has changed. So that's a great place to start. And people say, if I want to go in Latin America, what's going on now, what news service do I go to? If you want to know what's going on in Latin America, don't go to Fox News or CNN. You're wasting your time. My favorite news service, believe it or not, is BBC News. So if, if you see a story online from Mexico, it's a Mexican journalist, not somebody from Wisconsin or Chicago. All right? So, and if you read anything online, be very careful. Confirm what you read. Uh, don't get your news from Facebook. Any other questions? Well, if you're shy, I'll be up here for a little while. If you have any questions, you want to ask one-on-one. -on -one. Thank you very much.
thank you, everybody. Uh, Mr. Gonzalez, as he said, will be up front for questions if y'all didn't want to say anything into the microphone um, or, or be on YouTube or anything like that. Please feel free to go up and ask questions. Um, I am going to ask that you, if you go up there to ask questions, that you do make sure that your mask is up uh, on your face and covering your hands properly. Thank y'all all for coming out tonight. We appreciate all of you for coming out. Thank you. Thank you, and if you want my email address, go to my website, bobbygonzalez.com.